Welcome to everyone. Thank you for being here with us today. Um, my name is Maria Leticia Osadas. I'm a partner at Wilkie Frank Gallagher, and I also head our Latin American practice. Uh, thank you for the invitation. This is really a pleasure and, uh, and to have such a wonderful uh, group of speakers. So first, let me just like talk a little bit about uh, the Colombian American Association. And uh, thank you again for, for this invitation and for organizing this, uh, this wonderful conference. The association was founded in 1927 and is the first binational chamber of commerce for Colombia established in the US. The association is a private nonprofit business organization that seeks to disseminate up-to-date information on economic, financial, and political matters and promote commercial and cultural ties among the people in the two countries. That being said, I would like to thank uh, our sponsors for Wilkie. It's really a pleasure to be sponsoring this conference. And also thank you to Content Room and the partners Philip Morris International, Pro Colombia, we work, Look for Capital, Camera Colombiana de Comercio Electrónico, LAFCA, and Nisho Americas. So before we start this conversation, I would like to introduce, to briefly introduce the panelists. So let me start with Maria Teresa. Maria Teresa Arnal leads Stripe in Latin America. Stripe is a technology company that develops online economic infrastructure. Before joining Stripe, she led Google Mexico, as well as operations of Twitter in Argentina, Colombia, and Mexico. Maria Teresa was involved in the creation of Interactive Advertising Bureau in Mexico and was the president of the Council of World Internet Project in that country too. She's a member of the International Women's Forum and the Young Presidents Organization, YPO. Maria Teresa has an MBA from Columbia University and a bachelor's in industrial engineering from Universidad Católica Andrés Bello in Venezuela. Martin Shrimp is a mechanical engineer from Edinburgh University with over 15 years in FinTech and SES experience. He is the founder of seven technology companies, and just to mention some, the U, Accendo, and Sinove are you know, some of, uh, of the ones that are, are very well known. Bay2 has more than 2,000 employees and revenues over 300 million US um, dollars. Martin was selected Endeavor Entrepreneur in 2010. He's an active angel investor with over 20 investments up to date and is also the board member in many of these tech companies. Martin left Bay U in 2017 to focus on Sinove now the largest fintech in Colombia and is involved in the process of expanding Sinove's operations in Mexico. Felipe Lega Gutierrez is an industrial engineer from Universidad de los Andes and has a master in finance from Columbia University. He has served as deputy superintendent and advisor to the office of the financial superintendent of the financial superintendency of Colombia, deputy director of market integrity of the Financial Regulation Unit. He was expert professional in the operations and market development department of the Colombian Central Bank. And he is currently the general director of Financial Regulation Unit, Unidad de Regulación Financiera. So as you can see, we have a very notable uh, panel uh, and we will be discussing uh, you know, some of the FinTech issues. So, uh, well, Latin America is one of the heavily impacted region by COVID. And even though uh, almost all the countries in the region, including Colombia, have eased and otherwise removed uh, some of the mandatory lockdown restrictions, it is a fact that you know, the reactivation of the, econo of the economy is still a challenge. Um, but we're also starting to see something uh, of the, some positive effects of, uh, of the pandemic and the crisis. And one has been the strong and fast development of the fintech industry in the last couple of months. So Colombia is having a strong boom in the fintech industry because there is a need to provide financial access to citizens heavily impacted by the pandemic and to all sectors of economy. Collaboration among the public sector, banks, and financial technology firms has led to 2 million people approximately to open deposit accounts for the first time between March and the end of June. 
according to estimates from Banca de las Oportunidades, a government institution focused on financial inclusion. So this is far above the estimated total of 1.4 million who sign up the, in their first bank accounts in 2018. As mentioned by the director of Banca de Oportunidades in an interview of an S&P Global Market Intelligence. So due to these recent developments, Colombia has strengthened its position as the third fintech ecosystem in Latin America over the past years, right behind Mexico and Brazil, with a 60% growth reported last year. The Colombian ecosystem features one of the most interesting behaviors of the continent in terms of financial technologies. So a lot happening um, and uh, a lot to invest in the industry that will create, of course, you know, jobs and also facilitate economic transactions in the country. And it will be also used as a tool to fight informal and non-reporting businesses. So since this is a topic that will have a strong and positive impact in the reactivation of the economy, we will spend the next hour or so talking about window opportunities challenges, risk, and role of government, among other topics. Just a housekeeping announcement. Please remember that you can send your questions on the Q&A. I will read the questions, and they will be answered on the last 30 minutes. So why don't we start? Um, so Martin and Felipe, you know, how the, the COVID has accelerated uh, this change in, in the Colombia's fintech sector. Maybe we can start with you, Martin, and, and then we can go to Felipe. Thanks, Maria Leticia, um, and thanks for having me on, on this panel. Yes, I think it's, it's been super interesting how, um, how it's accelerated certain aspects of fintech. I mean, on the one side, uh, COVID, of course, put balance sheet lenders and the fintech uh, in, in, in a more complicated situation, similar to, to banks. Uh, we had to kind of change the rules of, of credit score and how that could work. But on the other hand, it's also created a whole new panorama on, on the fintech uh, side and, and opportunities. So I'd probably um, highlight two things that, are, that have really shown on the acceleration side of that. One is due to the pandemic and due to all the, all the issues um, happening with it and, and the worries of how the economy will turn, the banks in general have put more restrictions on, on, the, on the way they can give loans and, and they've been more cautious about it, which has uh, allowed certain fintechs to be able to, because of the, the different credit models that they have and the way they do the credit scoring, has allowed fintechs to start uh, giving loans to certain segments that maybe before would be more un unserved or underserved uh, by the banks. So that's definitely created this, this, this gap and this opportunity. Um, and in general, the second bit that we see is, as even in the past, um, the banks uh, couldn't get to certain segments of the population or certain companies just because there wasn't so much uh, data, the fintech started really taking that space. And what we saw was that when the government wanted to give a lot of uh, help to uh, certain companies or individuals, um, that they were finding it hard to be able to get to that segment of the population just because the banks didn't have the, the necessary, the banks had the technology or the capabilities. And that's where the fintechs came into play. So it's been, it's been very, very interesting. I mean, um, I think Duque in general has been very pro working with technology companies and, and entrepreneurship. And then with the fintech side, they really caught on onto that at, at an early stage. I mean, we started working with the government together with them pretty much March, end of March, when we knew this was coming. And they, I think Colombia was one of the first governments that really decided to work closely with the fintechs to start distributing loans to unserved markets and the, the population. And that was a, I, I mean, I currently now live in Mexico. Mexico didn't do any of that, that, that thought. So I was actually very uh, pleased to see how, how the Colombian government reacted to that, how they saw that there was an opportunity to work with fintechs to get to the, to the unserved population and help through this pandemic. So I think the, 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 the combination of those two have really um, put fintech on the map in a different way. Uh, and the fact that actually 
the government is willing to work with fintechs uh, and smaller entities still than, 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 than banks to be able to get to that segment of population is, is, is incredibly interesting. So I don't know what Felipe could add to that, but I think those are the two things that I think have been really fast at accelerating in the COVID. Thank you, Martin. Maybe we, we talk a little bit about what the, the government and the regulator has been doing, Felipe. Well, thank you very much, uh, Maria Leticia. First, let me start by, by saying that it's an honor and a pleasure to, to share this panel with you guys. And, and definitely, as, as you described, Maria Leticia, at the beginning, I mean, this has been a very interesting uh, context that we're facing right now. And, and let, let me just start by saying that definitely we have some some very good goals that we have achieved during this during the pandemics, but this is the result because of the policy that we have been creating and implementing during the last several years. This is not a, uh, so this is something resulting from this from this process. And and Martin was saying about like how close we we feel and how close we work with the fintech industry, and that's something that has been happening since the beginning of the fintech industry in Colombia itself. If we can say that is that, that that there is a beginning of the fintech industry because that's something innovation is something that has been under under review for several years. But fintech, the term fintech is, is quite recently, let's say. But but uh, let me just give a step back and say and say what, what I mean about the context is, is about that that we have been implementing a, a policy a public policy on developing the, the, the on actually boosting the, the innovation and the technology to be part uh, on, on a very uh, correlated way with the development of, of the of our financial system. Uh, we started this process from, uh, on the financial inclusion. Definitely, is something that has to do with the financial inclusion process that we have been. Uh, uh, going through in the, at least for the last seven years or so. Uh, that's something that we can count on, on very huge achievements on this matter. And if we can use the, this word during this pandemic context, we were fortunate to, to face the pandemic with a very good state in, in, in terms of, of financial inclusion, uh, in terms of infrastructure and in terms of development that definitely we have some challenges ahead but that there is something that, that, that is part of this process that we have been facing. As, as Martin was saying, uh, it's, it's not uh, rare for us to work closely with the FinTech industry. That's why when Sinove approaches the, the, the government to actually uh, use the credit guarantee, the, the, the guarantees that were offering by the, by the uh, Fondo Nacional de Garantias, definitely is a must. I mean, it, it's, we, can, we have to use technology. It's not something that we have to debate. It's something that is in, in the place right now. Uh, and we have actually, as I was saying, we have to boost. Uh, you, you were describing at the beginning, Maria Teresa, the, the developments. Definitely we have some recent developments in terms of new social programs that actually take leverage on, this, on these results that I was saying before. Uh, Ingreso Solidario was a really huge achievement in terms of the, of the amount of time that we took to, to reach almost 3 million people uh, for the for the other social programs, it, it took us almost uh, two decades to, to to reach the same amount of people. So that's how you you can you can measure the 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 speed of change that technology brings us, and that's why it's very important for us to always take this into consideration and take the, the innovation, take the technology every time into the table, every time we take a, a discussion on the public policy and in, in particular into developing a, a, a regulatory framework, which is something that, that we do in the Financial Regulation Agency. That's something that is always on the table when we take the discussion and with, with every player that is in, the, in definitely with you guys here in the, in the panel, but with, with every player in our context. And I think that's why you, you can say that is something that, uh, that can place us in a, on a very interesting place. And you can describe the Colombian environment as being very thriving into boosting financial inclusion, to boosting financial technology. Uh, we have some several measures telling us. Recently, they, they launched the, the, the global microscope telling by, uh, for the three years in a row that we're in the first place into developing a, 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 an environment that actually boosts the financial inclusions in terms of, of adopting technology. That's something that is recognized there. And as I was saying, this is a result of several years of work uh, to having a, an explicit financial inclusion policy that always focuses on, on digital, with, with, the, with this digital focus that, that is very important to have it right now. Oh, just, sorry, Maria Leticia, just to, to add. Go ahead. I, I think it's also just been very interesting how I mean, you know, this is new 
not only for the government, but also for fintechs, so how quickly we have to adapt and how, you know, we're trying to attack certain segments of the population that the government and the fintechs maybe weren't even attacking before the pandemic. And it's been very interesting seeing how, you know, like we set it up, we set up with a certain rules that we started working with the Fondo Nacional de Garantías and the government uh, to try and get to them. And then we're seeing that the rules that we'd put in place were uh, maybe too rigid. And it was very interesting to see how fast, uh, in all credit to the government, the Colombian government, how fast it adapted and was willing to start doing changes and working with, with fintechs to be able to do that. Again, to be able to do change in credit scores and risk models for banks, it would be it would be a very slow process. It'd be very hard for them because of the of the, the, the regulation typically that they have in place. But having this flexibility together with the government and how we could do it with the fintechs has been uh, just been a very good learning curve. And I think it's uh, it's been yeah it's been fascinating to see how how both government and a private entity could work as fast to get to where we got to. So it has been my experience on uh, working uh, on Latin American matters for many years, and you know, not not because I'm Colombian, um, I will be saying this, but uh, but it's definitely you know what you describe, uh, Martin, and what Felipe said. Uh, the there is a, a tendency to be flexible and to really try to adapt and and really talk to the different market participants and find solutions. So that has been my experience so far. So. Talking about that, what, what do you think are the key aspects of Colombian fintech industry that attract international investment firms and multinational companies um, such as Stripe, uh, Maria Teresa, for example? Uh, well, I think that, you know, first of all, um, I couldn't think of a more aligned um, way to see the goals that the Colombian government have, you know, has today with goals that Stripe, companies like Stripe or probably, you know, um, Martins companies or any fintech uh, in the region basically have, right? Which is, we know that empowering businesses and consumers to have more financial inclusion will drive economic growth, will basically, you know, help us fight corruption, will help us, you know, formalize the economy and so on and so forth. So I think that this is, you know, the first thing I, I, I think it, it's important to mention here is um, the alignment on the goals is, is very clear, right? We all wanna achieve that. And, and I think that um, we will do so and, and Colombia will be an, a very attractive market if that regulatory framework that has been, you know, discussed in, in by Felipe and, and Martin so far, is, is a very progressive and smart one. And, and I am, um, I mean, there is, there is no way that you can have innovation, right, in, in an industry or in a market, if you impose very onerous uh, rules and, and very, let's say, not very clear rules of the road for uh, companies to play with. And so uh, I think that that is something that, I, you know, we look to the Colombian government to, to very clear establish, very clear rules of the road, uh, very fast and non-bureaucratic processes with respect to whatever, you know, regulatory processes they establish. Uh, we see, you know, in an interesting way, and, and I think Martin was referring to this um, too, and it's a pity I also live in Mexico, so I know exactly what he was referring to when he said, you know, it, in, in Mexico there, have, there was an attempt to get there, which honestly, um, it's, been um, a rather uh, slow attempt to to really get to a place where um, the market now it's an attractive one and and honestly as, as stripe if you know if we see, if we look at the market today versus the market a few years ago uh, given everything that has happened with respect to fintech and and the regulation etc it, it's you know we probably would have made different decisions at this point. Uh, I hope that, you know, Colombia looks to that as an example of what not to do and what not to follow. And I probably look more, and Brazil, by the way, is in kind of in the same uh, bucket there. Um, uh, I think that um, markets like, I don't know, Argentina has this kind of interesting new uh, thing around, you know, being, having proactive reporting instead of having, you know, very strong regulation around uh, certain uh, financial products. Uh, we think, you know, of course, countries like Singapore have a very interesting, you know, way of um, compartmentalizing, you know, the, the different um, 
roles and, and, and licenses required to play in different, um, uh, for different products and, 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 and services. And, and I think that, but, but it's very clear, right? The rules of the road are clear. The processes are streamlined. It's fast, it's not onerous. And, and that's, I think, the key to really unlocking the opportunity in Colombia. There's, there's no doubt that there's a big opportunity in Colombia. The cost of operating in Colombia has to match basically uh, that opportunity. And that's what we look for. Thank you, Maria, Maria Teresa. Uh, Martin, do you want to add to it? Yeah, no, definitely. I think um, I mean, when you look at uh, foreign investment and specifically for the fintech industry in Latin America, of course, you know, typically you straight away think Brazil because of the size and then Mexico uh, and, and, you know, and then actually in, in third place is, is coming Colombia. But if you go beyond just the market size, I think Colombia has got a very powerful aspects. I mean, it's, you know, historically it's been one of the more stable uh, countries in, in Latin America. It's uh, never defaulted on, on sovereign debt. Um, access to data is actually better in Colombia that I've seen than even uh, Brazil or Mexico, quite a lot better. Um, the credit bureaus are in better shape as well. They're, they're kind of, they're more business friendly. They've, uh, they've advanced quite a lot uh, in that sense. Um, so I think there's a lot of, there's a lot of pros of why you could make Colombia the hub for maybe, if, you know, if you're doing foreign investment or foreign um, kind of a global fintech company, to think as, as Colombia as, as, as possible headquarters as well, not only just investing in, in current uh, fintech companies, but making it a good place for, for headquarters. Geographically, uh, it's a great location um, because it's like a five hour flight to each point. Um, it's also a very good testing ground. I mean, it's interesting. When I was in, in payments with PayU, we were seeing that um, defaults in Colombia uh, or, or fraud in general in Colombia, funny enough, was quite a lot lower than like, for instance, Mexico. Mexico is three times higher. And then now I'm in, in the credit space and, you know, giving loans, uh, the faults in Mexico, again, are quite a bit higher. That can be up to, you know, if you consume a credit, you're getting three times higher than, than Colombia. So as a testing ground, Colombia is not a bad place. It's a, it's a smaller market. It's going to be uh, cheaper to actually start off, but it's, uh, it's, and those sides are very good. And then finally, I would add to, um, again, I, I may be, praising the current government, but uh, the current government's been very pro-business um, and very helpful for, for not just fintechs, but the startup, startup ecosystem, contrary again to a lot of other Latin American countries that haven't really shown that. So if you combine all those things together, I think, it's, um, I think that may be the reason why we're, we're seeing a lot more investment coming into fintech and and uh, seeing companies like Stripe looking now at, uh, at Colombia and, and other ones. So very excited about that. Great, thank you. And, uh, you know, Maria Teresa, you mentioned, uh, you know, like some of the characteristics that will really drive, let's say the investment in a country, like, you know, being, uh, like the flexibility, of course, not having the onerous rules and having certainty, which is so important, right? Uh, so, Felipe, what, what would you say are some of these policies that have been really important and, you know, that, that will uh, kind of embrace what, uh, what Maria Teresa and Martin um, just said and, and really help the, the ecosystem to keep developing and improving? Definitely, Maria Leticia. Yeah, no, first of all, <clears throat> let me say that it's kind of funny that several years ago the discussion was about regulation not uh, messing around with, the, with, with innovation. And we don't need regulation. Regulation is bad. Regulation is our enemy. And I think the discussion is taken into the into the good way. Actually, we need good regulation. Of course, definitely a bad regulation is, is really bad. It's much better to have no to not have any regulation at all instead of a bad regulation. But it's much better if you had a good regulation. A regulation based on principles, based on flexibility, based on actually boosting the, the innovation itself. And that's something that the discussion is is it's been right now. Uh, and I mean, it's been there for several years in the case of Colombia. And that's why, and, and the reason why, why that's the case in Colombia is because we, we build this uh, 
on, on a very collaborative uh, on, on a collaboration basis with the, with the private sector definitely it's something that uh, for sure we don't know all the details we don't know all the all the obstacles that they face for we have our own fears we we have to make sure that the stability of the system is there we have to make sure that the consumer protection is there that's a must that we have to to be always careful uh, but but then the rest of the of the of the story is 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 uh, completed by the by the players by the private sector and and we tend to think that here in colombia we actually have a very fluent conversation with the, with the private sector. Uh, I'm, I'm the head of the financial regulation agency and I'm, I talk all the time with the, with the private players, uh, not to obey, definitely, it's something that is to listen, just to the, the mere process of listening, the mere process, process of sitting all together and listening all the, all, the, all the sides, all the points of view, it's very important when you build a, a public policy, in this case, in the terms of, a, of a financial inclusion, public policy in case of the, development of the system financial system itself in terms of the on building a policy that is going to be very successful because remember that the public policy is if, if, you, if you can describe it it's just a mere document that is published by, by the ministry of finance but the ones that actually take that into the reality is the private sector you you can you can do a really good degree you can develop a, a really nice regulatory framework but the ones that are actually making it a reality is the private sector so if you would build it with them if you actually construct some some goals, if you actually uh, prior to the to the implementation, you actually build out together with them, they are more engaged into the into the implementation process, and that's why I think uh, we have been very successful into uh, developing a very thriving uh, environment for financial inclusion for fintech companies for startups, as Martin was saying, and and that's gonna that's part of the receipt of the success that we have been having, and it's gonna be there for the definitely in in the in the coming future definitely. That that's very exciting, and it, it looks like uh, like the government and the regulators are doing what needs to be done to to get there. So, but still, so according to the World Bank, uh, fifty five percent of the Colombian uh, population remains without access to bank services, and only fourteen fourteen point five percent receive financing from financial institutions. Uh, the past history of crime and money laundering has left, you know, some, some let's say, um, some of some citizens and financial institutions sometimes hesitant to give their money to a third party because they do not want to fund illegal activities. So these issues will raise some concerns for the emerging fintech ecosystem. And what do you think can be done uh, by all parties involved? Again, you know, I mean, we, we understand that this is like a, uh, something that has to be done between the public and the private sector. Uh, so what can be done? What do you think, uh, you know, Maria Teresa and Martin, that, that can be improved and, uh, to help that? Well, I, I think that, you know, this is where the tech in FinTech comes um, very handy, right? And, and I think that when you look at the problems with the traditional financial institutions is uh, the, that the tech is not there, right? And, and tech is, is a tool for transparency in this case. And, and that's how we kind of see that it is coming, no? uh, coming alive. You know, we, traditional institutions need to continue to build trust. But I think that digital tools can actually, you know, bring businesses and, and consumers closer to the money of their to the to their money movement, right? In in real time. And you know, when when you see um, I don't know, with Stripe, you know, drivers from Uber and Rapid just getting their money in their wallets, um, you know, very in a very clear, transparent and fast way, that creates trust. You no, know? and 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 I think that when you look at, you know, 70% of Latin Americans, they all have a smartphone and it's a way to basically put money, you know, in, in a very transparent way in their hands. Um, I think that, you know, as Stripe, what, what we try to do is ensure that those money movements are very efficient, very transparent and fast enough so that people can feel that they know what's going on. And it's not like in this, you know, removed place or removed institution where the money is going and they don't know when the, where, where the money lies and, and you know, when, when they're gonna get it. And so I think that, um, that tech here is, is the key for uh, to build the trust. And, and you know, when you see, uh, you know, Martin was just saying uh, the, the fraud levels, right? And, and the bad actors in the, 
in the system. In, in Latin America, is is big. Particularly, Mexico and Brazil are huge uh, uh, markets with you know challenges around this. Um, we have huge challenges here, and um, and when you see that we can you know use machine learning to identify patterns where we basically can identify the bad actors before they go into uh, the system. This is the way that we think that financial institutions and financial services will be um, more efficiently and more uh, secure and in a more trusted way, put in the hands of the consumers. Thank you. Martin? Sure. Um, I think it's interesting to, to see it from the, um, I mean, historically, it hasn't been easy, as, as I said before, for um, for banks to get into the more unserved um, market, particularly because there wasn't much information of this more unserved market, be it consumer or or companies, and as there wasn't much information to build those credit uh, the, the, the credit score risk models was complicated, right? So I think that's, you know, that's definitely um, one aspect of it. And I think fintechs are now slowly covering that gap and, and hope, and not even fintechs, but we work very close together with banks uh, to be able to do that, to give our technology and to be able to get to banks. But then you've got the other side, which is interesting to understand, is the actual um, individuals or, or, or small companies, right? Uh, or like um, what we call SMBs that when you actually start interviewing them and finding out, they're pretty resilient about the idea of getting credit. They're, they're kind of scared of it. Um, and it, there's two aspects to that. One is because their financial education is, is, is uh, relatively low. So they don't, you know, they don't have complete clarity of, you know, this is actually gonna help them or this is gonna get into a spiral of debt and then they're not gonna be able to uh, manage it. And then the second bit is they're also worried about, you know, cash kind of works for them. And, and they're worried that if they start uh, getting into credit and using everything more online, that the, the tax uh, is going to come and get them, the tax regulators or, or the, you know, uh, they're going to be taxed highly on this. And when you, when you, I mean, we've done a study uh, in a lot of these cases and really gone into them, and this is what's happening. So there's two aspects that we need to kind of cover in this. One is the government to also start seeing how we can give maybe certain tax breaks or make them more comfortable that they can get on this and there's, there's a limit so it won't affect them so much. Because at the end of the day, we want, you know, we want everyone to be doing digital transactions. It's a lot more transparent. It's better for the country. It's better for the government not to have to deploy cash and, and printing cash is expensive. So if we find that, if we really crack that side, then they will be, they'll feel more comfortable. Uh, a lot of these small entities will feel more comfortable. And the second, uh, which has been super interesting, we, we've, um, we've been doing pilots giving um, credits to you know, ferreteros and, and, and tenderos. And initially when we went out to give them credits, they were super concerned about it. It's like, no, I don't want a credit. This is not going to help my business. And then we, where we worked closely with like players like Semix and Holsim, we, we managed to give them kind of a credit line where they wouldn't have to pay anything for the first, say, 15 or 30 days. So then they started using it like a means of cash flow. And what we saw was, I mean, we had, we had certain clients that the, the sales increased five times because of that. But on average, all the players that we gave this credit line to increased the sales over 40%. And so when you start getting that data and really showing you know, future potential players that if, if you use a credit line in the right way, it can really help your cash flow. It can get you the, more, the, the inventory that you need, that more clients will have, that will, more clients will need and actually increase your sales. That's super interesting. But it's been very rare that we get that, that statistics or that, that data for the really underserved population uh, to get them on, 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 the, on the whole idea of, you know, credit can be a very good thing. I think in the US, the mindset is different. It, it, you understand that credit, if you use wisely, is going to help you grow your business. It's going to help you with your cash flow. 
but that doesn't happen so much in, in Latin America, Colombia. So if we attack those two aspects as, you know, one side is the, the fintechs with the private entity to help, you know, what we're doing currently. And the other side is the government kind of giving them more certainty, actually, guys, you know, we're not going to tax you immediately just because you're showing your numbers. There's a, there's a tax bracket and it's not going to affect you in the way you think it is. I think that will uh, accelerate the, the adoption of, of, uh, of credit and new technologies to get them more on, online. Yeah, I, I to yeah. add to that, Martin, I, I think that um, it's alignment around incentives, right? Really what you need. You want to drive the right behavior. And, and so um, people who are part of the informal economy have you know, certain benefits, I would say, right? <laughs> that what they perceive to be a benefit. How, how can we change that to be, you know, a, 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 not a benefit, but a disadvantage and then, you know, have a benefit towards going into electronic payments. And, and I think that that's a very key thing that if, if we, if governments and the policy do not get aligned towards that, it's very, very, it's gonna be very hard to get consumers of cash. Um, because those, the incentives are not aligned, and then it's natural, right? It's it's it's, it's human behavior. So, uh, I think you talk you touch a, a, a very very important point. There's a there's a very interesting example of this in India, right? In in how uh, the government kind of encouraged businesses to and, and people to start uh, going. Well, there, there was an initial very a very strong controversy around you know the the lack of uh, money circulation, but I think that uh, cash circulation. But I think that at the end there there is this tax uh, incentives that are that are clear for for people that that go um, to the formal side of the economy as well as you know other benefits aligned to to the uh, formalization and. And, and the other thing you touched on, which I, I think it's, it's very important and it's not to be um, minimized, is, is basically education, right, around the importance of, of finance in general. It's like, what is a credit for? And, you know, we've, we've been a region that has had a very little access to credit in history. So people have always been like, very afraid of getting credit because getting credit meant you know you had um, you had to pay very high um, costs or you know interest rates and and so on and so forth and and you know there's always this uh, say in, in Spanish that they say that the the most the, the cost the costly the most costly costly um, credit is the one that you don't have right that that has been the norm in latin america so how can we change that and i think that um, education is, is huge there and the government should also i mean fintechs but also the government should also be part of that of that solution in in my opinion definitely let me say if i may i have to interrupt. yes of course and, and, and of course i i was about to to ask you felipe because uh, you know i think the the, the points that, uh, that maria teresa just tried like uh, education transparency Transparency, right, and and how we we help building that trust. So please go ahead. I think Felipe is frozen. Felipe. I I think so, right? How about now? Oh, he's back. back. Yes, now he's back. Fine. Sorry. Yes. Uh, let me just start again. No, no, I, I was starting about saying that I, I always struggle with the, with the numbers that you share at the beginning, because when, when you say that we have our financial inclusion index about 45 uh, percent, we are fortunate to have something. Actually, Martin uh, said that before we have really great data in, in our case and we have our credit bureaus have really good data. And, and we can say that our financial inclusion index is more about 86 percent. Uh, and, but but you have to read these numbers very carefully because of course we have 86 percent of adults having an, an, an a financial product really and active out of the, these 70 something are active but the thing is that many people actually don't think that they have a financial product probably they they use use it to get the 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 conditional transfer or the unconditional transfer from the government for example and you don't think that they have an account for example they think that, that that's only the channel how to get the resources for the social programs but but this can tell you what is the big challenges and the key is what what maria teresa and martin just said before that's the key the the usage of the of the financial products and and the added value that the people that the customer actually perceive 
and that's something and definitely very linked with the with the with the financial literacy definitely so uh, our big challenges that we have ahead of us are, are pretty much this how can we boost the 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 utilization of the financial products actually uh, that people actually perceive the, the the much more benefit that you have when you actually use transaction in a digital way instead of the of, of cash transactions that are pretty much the majority of our transactions in our economy in particular where to, when you're talking about p2p transaction and actually p2b transaction itself that's that's still the majority we are talking about higher than 90 percent of the transactions are still on cash and that's because we 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 have to tackle the obstacles or, or the things that are actually making this happen still and for for sure we have several benefits we have benefits on security we have benefits on traceability that are going to be very important into, into building your, your traceability on transaction for credit scores for credit access uh, as, as martin was saying but the thing is that people have to be aware of that people have to perceive that and people have to to be, be a ready to actually use the financial transaction when your uh, everyday basis is, is, is based on, on cash because you take a bus you you buy on a mom and pop shop but they all only receive cash that's the the only alternative you have and that's what we have been de developing a uh, regulatory framework to actually boost payment systems to actually uh, boost the, the 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 acceptance of, of, of digital payments the acceptance of, of digital transaction to to change this reality to change the reality on every, on every corner of our territory and then we can have a different conversation Maria Teresa was talking about an experience that they have in India about actually forbidding the people to actually transact in cash. That's not the approach that we have been taking. We first need to develop the, the adequate environment to actually move to that. We have to present the, the benefits and, and something as, as, as Maria Teresa was saying, and probably that's the, big, the biggest challenge because the results are always in middle and long term is the financial literacy. People have to be confident of, on the system. People have to be confident on the digital world itself itself uh, actually uh, you were uh, at the beginning of the panel talking about the, the the huge achievements that we that we take on the ingreso solidario program and definitely many people actually uh, took the, their first steps into the financial system through this program and they're actually the good thing is that they're actually starting to use it to use this program to use this this account sorry and they actually many of many of them actually <clears throat> reload the accounts and use it in several ways to pay bills to pay groceries etc cetera, etc cetera. But the, 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 the big challenge that we had ahead of, ahead of us is that to, to maintain this and to actually improve it. Uh, unfortunately, this is a uh, let's hope, let, let's see how it's gonna be developing in, the, in 2021. Uh, but that's the big challenge that we're facing right now. They, to, to boost the usage, to actually uh, present the added value of the financial products to the, to the consumers uh, on a much easier way. And that's all linked through the financial literacy. Definitely those are the challenges. We have been developing a financial uh, uh, inclusion and, and financial literacy policy pro uh, document that was released late, uh, several months ago. It is a COMPES uh, 44005 to actually make it an explicit conversation and getting all actors, all players together to to bring this conversation and to build this together as we have been doing lately. I would like to add, sorry, Maria Leticia. Of course, um, go I think go it's ahead. super interesting what Filippo is saying and, it, and it's true that, you know, you look at people and it's a cash economy and they're like, well, you know, why should I use anything apart from cash when I go to most places and they can't accept the payment? Um, and again, I think that's when we have to, you know, the government and the private sector have to work closer together to actually uh, get to these points. So I'm gonna give you an example of Colombia compared to Europe when it goes down to, to digital payments and receiving payments, like I'm, I'm an investor in quite a few that do you know, terminals, POS terminals. You know, first of all, Colombia has got one of the highest interchange fees um, in the world. It's, 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 it's pretty high. Um, unfortunately, uh, a big part of, of earnings for banks and, any, and, and that side are still like transactions and payments rather than credit, which should be the traditional model. So, you know, we have to work for slowly the, the banks to start actually making more money on credit, making them profitable there and, and be able to lower the actual transaction fees. Because if you have high transaction fees, that's already stopping you know, digital payments as, as one thing. But then the second part is um, 
interchange fees. And then Colombia is one of the, the few uh, governments or countries that actually charges immediately uh, taxes when you do uh, when you do a credit card transaction. Um, so they do and I understand, you know, it, it makes sense in theory to be able to charge those preemptively. Um, but what happens still in the informal sector is that when you actually start adding all those things, for the informal sector to receive a payment is costing them, say, four to five percent. Whether it's to receive cash, it's zero. So there's a complete misalignment there uh, of the incentives for that tienda to actually receive a digital payment. Until, if, until we don't crack that together, the government, the, the private sector, it's going to be very hard for them to, to say, well, why would I accept this? Um, and maybe work on those incentives. I, I, know, I don't know if I'd go as far as, as what Maria Leticia was saying, as um, what you were saying about India, sorry, that, that they're forcing them or fining them if they use cash, but maybe work on the right incentives for them to start using more digital payments, knowing the cost of cash uh, for the government as it as it works. So yeah, I, it's an interesting panorama, but I just wanted to point out that that's one example of, of why the adoption for a lot of people is like, just doesn't make sense if it's going to cost me 5% rather than zero in cash, right? By the way, I just want to clarify, I wasn't, I wasn't supportive of the India example. I was just saying that's kind of the extreme, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah no, thing that, that thing that did work on India, that was very controversial. And actually, people were really mad about the, the, the measures that Modi took at the, at the time. But I think that what really worked there was the tax alignment. And I think that, that, that that's something to be, uh, which is what you're saying, right, Martin? It's like how... How can this be aligned and how can we make this less onerous for an SME, yeah. which is very onerous today? And then, you know, I'd rather just have the cash, which is not zero cost, but perceived zero cost. Yeah. Right? But what, what India did really well was created this QR code system like Cody in Mexico and made sure it was directly taken out of the bank account and zero fee. Right. So you 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 punish people for using cash, but you give them an alternative that's actually better than cash. So I think that's where they got it right in a certain way, right? But anyhow. <laughs> so, no, but, th but that, that, that's very interesting and actually moves to the question, Maria Teresa, that, uh, that you know, we, we have been discussing is like, what can be the incentives, right? Like uh, there, there needs to be a benefit, there needs to be an alignment and how, uh, what would you say or what would you recommend let's say, um, to the regulators to kind of speed up and the government to speed up that process? Yeah, I think, I think, there's, um, uh, I think there's no silver bullet here. I, I would just say like, you know, for us in, in a stripe, when, when we look at Colombia, we still see things that are kind of in limbo. So particularly, I, you know, we would like to see those things, uh, those decisions made and, and advanced. Uh, but, um, but particularly, you know, for like the whole ecosystem, I think that there's no silver bullet, and 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 it's um, and I think Colombia is in in the right direction in, in that respect. I also I, I just think that this tax thing uh, and and the right you know um, math uh, and how that that math works need, needs to be very clear for uh, for people to really look at this uh, at this uh, you know platforms in in a more interesting way uh, covid helped us get there because we were forced to right and i think that 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 this that should be taken advantage of because people you know they say people build habits in 21 days well we certainly have had more than 21 days of covid right now it's like, i don't know we're like in a i lost track thank god it's like nine months now right uh, but uh, but you know people got used to it and, and a lot of people who'd never paid before in 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 you know in an, any form of electronic payment uh, are now doing so. A lot of merchants who didn't accept any electronic payments are doing so now. So I think that uh, you know there's there's very good momentum and 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 I think that there's just a few things that need to be tweaked and, and in the system and as an ecosystem uh, way it's the literacy is the incentives is the you know the the clarity on on the regulation and 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 and, and that regulation of being onerous and, and being you know kind of progressive enough so that we're all we all feel like we're in a good place uh, I, I think that that will help a lot thank you 
Thank you, Maria Teresa. So why don't we discuss a little bit about the forthcoming regulation uh, for payment systems in Colombia, Felipe? Sure. Uh, well, uh, as you were saying, and, and, and Martina Maria Teresa were talking about this, there are several dimensions that, that you have to tackle when you're trying to boost actually the, the use of digital transactions. So one of them is the is the tax side, definitely. And, and first, let me start with this. On the, on the tax side, we have been uh, going through a path of, of formalization of the of the of the of the commerce of the all the players and then you have very important struggles in terms of developing a, a simplified regime to actually make people formal in the terms of tax and that's a very huge bet in this in this sense to actually uh, try to tackle the things that martin described about the rete fuente rete iva all the retes whatever you want to add so that's that's the first thing and they are strictly correlated with the other side which is the financial regulation and the regulatory framework for the players itself on the on the financial side that's what you're asking actually we have been developing the, a new regulatory framework for the last actually two years I and mean, that's how the time passes very 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 fast and uh, I, unfortunately i haven't been able today to give you the good news that the, that the decree is already issued but it's a matter of days that the decree is going to be released and, and the, the, the main changes that are going to be that you can find in this in these new regulatory frameworks actually boosting the acceptance, boosting the 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 the, the acceptance of digital transactions. And right now, the only players that are, were allowed to actually uh, <clears throat> deploy the acceptance were only the banks or the, the financial institutions. And of, definitely, they have been doing a, a, a good job in terms of of, of deploying. Uh, devices deploying some device that can accept the credit debit cards etc cetera, etc cetera. but uh, but as, as we were saying before the pace of change the pace of, of that we need to to take into into this change of the infrastructure in, into the acceptance of digital transactions much be much higher and and for that we need new players coming into the field we need new acquirers uh, uh, being able to actually uh, perform in a much faster way, bringing new technologies, bringing the discussion of QR, which is already in place in Colombia, bringing the discussion of new biometric acceptance, et cetera, et cetera. As we were saying, technology is really changing uh, on a very fast pace. And that's why the bringing new, allowing new players, new acquirers to, to play in our field is going to be boosting the, the competition in this matter. It's going to help us reduce the, the, the fee that Martin was saying before. Definitely, we have a really high fee, and you can tackle this with with competition, with new players, with technology that is going to be uh, actually leveraging much uh, cost efficient models, and that's probably the big bet that we're facing right now in the in, in, in this new regulatory framework. You have to the, uh, let me just describe it in this simple way: is actually painting the, the whole picture, who are the players, what are their roles, what are their, their responsibilities, uh, who can do what, and in terms of actually who can be the acquirers. And, and, and the big change here is that it's not only for, for financial institutions, for banks and SEPs, but also for new on, on, uh, new players that, that, that don't have to be supervised by the financial superintendency. They can actually uh, just register in the financial superintendency uh, making sure that you that you fulfill the, the some requirements, uh, some entry requirements, and that's it. That's the good thing that you you can ensure the stability of the system itself with this with these minimum requirements, and then you just fulfill the, the rest of the of the of the framework that you that every player comply in the in the system. And that that's the good thing. You can boost the competition. You can bring new technology. We have to we we need to boost the pace of change, the pace of deploying new technologies. And the big bet is that that uh, when you actually go to a mom and pop shop in the in the farthest uh, town in in Colombia, you can actually pay with with your with your cell phone, with your eye, with whatever is going to be the technology in place in in, the, in, in this time. So that's probably the, the, the is our big bet when you can see this example for in other countries like Brazil. Some changes like that actually boost the acceptance in a, in a very highly way. So that's the, if we have at least the same experience, it's going to be a huge change in our in our context in the in the acceptance of digital transaction. And as we were discussing in the previous question, that's probably the biggest challenge that we have right now. And then we can have the discussion about actually uh, winning the fight against cash transactions in, in this sense. I wanted to add 
uh, something that, that Philippe said earlier on, which I think is, is kind of music to my ears, but, you know, regulation is key for, for everyone. I mean, you know, it's not like startups, entrepreneurs or us in the space don't want to be regulated. I mean, we want the right regulation in place. And sometimes, you know, that, that gets uh, misheard or misjudged in the sense that, you know, people think, oh, well, you know, the startups just don't want the regulation. When we started PayU in 2002, uh, there was no regulation for eight years or even longer. I mean, I mean, so we're like in gray zone, which is never comfortable. If, if you're an investor or an entrepreneur, you don't want that, right? You don't know what's going to happen and if the regulators are going to close you down eventually or not. And um, what I think has been uh, very interesting, again, on the Colombian government lately is this the new regulation that's coming out. They've been a lot closer to entrepreneurs in general and, and startups and finding out because like for instance, to give you an example of the fintech regulation that came out in Mexico, I feel I felt that what the regulators nearly did was like they went typically to banks or big financial institutions, and, and they weren't talking to the real tech, the startups, the ones that are doing things that are really disrupting the market, and finding out what their needs were. So then you get a framework that limits uh, innovation, that limits new entrepreneurs, or even stops certain entrepreneurs. And I think the Colombian government is actually understanding that in a different way, getting closer to these players to come up with the, the right regulation. So anyhow, I think it's, it's an important for governments to understand that, that you can't just go to the traditional players. You've got to go to the, sometimes these startups, uh, just because to understand what, how, how the ecosystem will thrive by doing the right regulation on them, making sure that the system works, but also allowing them to, to thrive. By the way, Martin, on the, on the Mexico um, example, which I think is, is, is a missed opportunity, as I said before, um, the government started conversations with the startups and the fintech industry. And actually, you know, the, the, the initial draft for the fintech law was very much driven by, you know, the need for innovation. The problem was um, when, you know, traditional players uh, started feeling uncomfortable about what, you know, that law implied in terms of competition and, and how this would basically increase competition, right? For, for these traditional players and would allow innovation that would other, otherwise not happen. And, and so a lot of the draft for the law was redlined and, and taken back because of that. So I hope that that doesn't happen in Colombia because then you're, fa you're, you're basically failing to to allow uh, people to innovate and, and I mean companies to innovate and, and you know I, I, I love uh, to hear Felipe saying that you know if it's truly on you know through our registration that that we will be uh, able to to go into the market then you know that certainly we will uh, make sure that we are there but this is kind of the spirit that uh, companies like Stripe and and like you know, any other fintech that really wants to uh, bring the power of technology in, into the financial services industry to, in, to foster inclusion will look for. So, um, yeah, I think that's, it's key. Well, that, that, that's very important. And I think, uh, you know, uh, Felipe, you were saying competition is, uh, is really important and you need to see the competition. So the, the market keeps moving, which is just what, you know, Maria Teresa also stressed. Uh, why don't we go to the, so we have some questions. So let me just open the questions. Um, let me start. Okay. Do you believe the special guarantees offered by the Fondo Nacional de Garantías will be extended beyond the summer of 2021? I think this. That's, that's for what go actually, to you. He's the guy actually closest to the Fondo. No, just kidding. <laughs> yeah, let, let, let me just remember. Let's say the the, the way the the government reacts to the to the pandemic was okay. We have to make sure that the credit still flows between the the all the people actually needing credit, and that's why we intervene into actually deploying these new warranty mm -hmm. lines. And as we were describing, it was very uh, successful because we we gathered all together all the players, all the financial institutions fintech companies, et cetera, et cetera. But that was actually to ensure that, that the credit still flows. To answer this question is a matter of how it's gonna be happening. What's, what's gonna be the context and, and by June, 2021? We're all thinking about uh, next year to be a recovery year. 
the, the discussions are more about the pace of recovery, but we're thinking on, on, a, on a much better context. In this way, uh, let's see, let's see how it develops. Uh, definitely right now we still need these guarantees. We still need people uh, or, or the, all the credit originators to still have this guarantee to, to, to be sure that the risk is not uh, over, over measure or still not, not making them being able to actually uh, still originate in credit. But yeah, let's see how it develops right now. We're thinking that the 2021 is going to be a much better year and a recovery year. Uh, and le let me just answer by let's let's hope not. Let's hope we don't we don't need this <laughs> to by by this time. Thank you, Felipe. So another question: in terms of connectivity and infrastructure, what are the biggest challenges right now? So I think this this can go to all of you. Let me just start because probably they can give you much more detail. I mean, within this question, it's a very interesting discussion about, it's not only a matter of financial system or financial transactions or financial products. We need infrastructure and we need this connectivity throughout the country. We need this 4G networks. We need this uh, yeah, internet connection, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, several years ago, we were discussing about SMS as the, as, the, as the channel, as the better technology to actually have financial inclusion. Right now, we all have smartphones, so many people have smartphones. We need apps, we need et cetera. And that's where the discussion about having connectivity is, is, is very important. And the, the Ministry of, of Telecommunication and Information Technology has been doing a great job in this matter. I mean, it's been modernizing of the, of the networks, et cetera, et cetera, but still a big challenge. I mean, remember that we have very, a challenging geography and and but but that's the thing um, it doesn't it doesn't mean that that we cannot have the, the discussion and the and the all the developments on the on the financial regulation side but definitely it's a it's a must that we have to go all together with the with the deploying of the right infrastructure to have all these achievements but i think this matter we have we have several challenges ahead on the on the connection Infrastructure, but we we can go to the to the road all together with the developments that we have right now on the financial inclusion side, on the financial development side. Sorry, but probably Maria Teresa and Martin have yeah. more to say about this. I'll I'll just add that no, I agree with Felipe. I think uh, it's funny because even though we've gone from SMS to you know a lot of people having smartphones, if you go to a lot of the, the smaller companies that we're trying to sometimes help and give credit to. Um, they might have a smartphone, but then they don't have uh, even the right connectivity or they don't have data um, and there's no internet. So you end up doing loans and doing these through WhatsApp, which isn't ideal. Um, I mean, communication, 100% of trying to give a loan and trying to give the service through WhatsApp, it's not that easy. Um, so I think there's definitely a limitation on how we get uh, how we massify this internet. So even though everyone now, I mean, the population is a huge amount of buying a smartphone, that they really are connected all the time, not only for credits, but payments is going to be really important as well uh, to be able to do it. And I mean, I, I was, I'm an investor in another company that does you know, online top-ups. And then the user, sometimes when they don't have data, then they can't do the online top-up. So they go back to the same habits of going to a shop to do an online top-up. And then when you try and, and as, a, as a tech company, talk to the telcos to try and make that page free so they can do the top-up, it's super complicated. Um, or it's very expensive. You, you have to like have volumes of $10, $20 million on revenues before you can even create free sites, even though you're assuming the cost of that. So there is a huge challenge uh, on connectivity, there's no doubt about it. And I think uh, ideally the, the gaps where, or the poorer sectors of the country, if, they, if there's ways that the government uh, and maybe in conjunction with the private sector help to increase that connectivity is gonna help payments, credit and technology adoption. Maria Teresa, anything you want to add? No, not really. I, I, I agree with everything that has been said. I, I think that it, it continues to be a challenge connectivity throughout the region, uh, of course. I, I would just say, um, you know, where we are now in the journey, it should not be a deterrent for 
um, the products and services that are being um, deployed. Because there's, um, I, I mean, I, I don't know the exact numbers for Colombia, and, and we, we were talking, you know, recently about data and how data flows, and 85% uh, as, as um, or 45%, depending on where you stand, right? Uh, being being um, kind of the the level of penetration of this uh, data flowing, but I think that that there is still a space within you know the current connected population to foster inclusion. So um, I, I would say you know let don't let this be a deterrent. Let's start and move fast and and continue to work on connectivity uh, as also you know. Another again, it's it's a multiple factors thing that we need to solve for. There's no silver bullet, right? Uh, so, I, yeah, the opportunity is, is today, not not when we are all connected. Thank you. Okay, so next question: What are the main segments that fintech startups and international companies are targeting? Maybe should I talk, take it first and then, okay. Of course. Um, look, I think historically FinTech, um, I think actually globally also, but, but also we can see the same thing happening in Latin America and Colombia, started off with payments because it was a space that um, was probably easier to get into the, to that, in, that, in that point and did not require the vast amounts of data that other spaces of FinTech uh, required. So I think we can see, you know, typically payments grew um, during, you know, 2000 to 2010, and they kept on growing and, and they're still growing dramatically. But I think that was a that was the first wave of fintech. What we've seen in the last five to six years now is different areas really um, exploding or, or growing at a different rate, which is balance sheet lending, which is what we do at Zenobi. We do consumer lending and SMB lending. We also see um, the wealth management that's starting to really take uh, another angle too. Um, and then the payment, the payment ecosystem is now expanding into different areas too, right? Uh, to try and get into better technologies for more offline payments as well. That's, uh, that's uh, getting attractive. And the final thing I think on, on the, where the fintech's going is now more, uh, tools and systems to help either fintechs or banks um, adopt this faster. So SaaS companies that do that. I mean, for instance, we work very closely with banks and other, and other partners to give our technology to allow them to get there because they have larger, larger balance sheets. They, you know, they want to deploy this, they want to do it, but they don't necessarily have the technology. So partnering what we're seeing in the ecosystem of banks partnering closer with fintechs i'm a great believer in that um and two or three years ago i would have said you know this is very hard for it to happen because banks were very like oh i'm seeing the fintechs as a competitors now they're realizing that you know they're taking spaces that the banks can't take and actually partnering can be very beneficial for both sides so i think that's what i'll say the kind of high level panorama of, of where the fintech industry is going then it might have to out you yeah, I, 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 there's there's a particular side of, of the internet here that I, I personally am very fond of, which is this idea of marketplaces and platforms, B2B SaaS or, you know, B2C on-demand platforms, whatever you want to call them. And and there's an interesting phenomenon in, in Latin America. We, we don't have as many players in that segment as other regions have. So if you look at, you know, well, the U.S. is, you know, they have huge players everywhere. But but um, but when you see uh, APAC and and Europe, this is this is a, a very predominant um, kind of category as well in terms of internet players. And and I think that for Latin America, we need to continue to foster the you know the marketplaces and B2B platforms, SaaS platforms, or again, all, any kind of platforms to look at this market with interest. And when you look at you know, what these platforms do is they basically 
support digitaliz digitization of SMBs, right? That's mainly what they do. And, and if you look at what happened in COVID, again, a lot of these SMBs were hardly hit, could not you know, sustain their businesses. A lot of them are closing their businesses. And so there, there's a very important role for these platforms to play here. Uh, but these platforms look at the region, you know, um, in a way where they 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 want to have the infrastructure in place. And infrastructure is probably the thing that Latin America has always have as you know somehow um, as a debt, right? <laughs> so I I think that you know if if we build infrastructure and we ensure that the money movement and and the different you know cross border um, possibilities are are built for this particular segment, it'll be more and more interesting for these companies to come to Latin America and invest. We already see that happening, you know, in, in with companies like Rappi, right? Rappi is, is, is a is a very it's it's a basically a platform where um, they they are connecting SMBs, and and so the more we foster these companies to come to the region, the faster that we will enable these SMBs to digitize. The more competition we'll have. Um, the faster you know economic recovery will come to so that that is a very interesting segment that we are and that that has a cross border um, factor there right that it's that it's very important and 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 it's you know when when we see a, a Colombia there that's that's a very interesting also opportunity to to basically look to uh, solve and so that's kind of where we we are in in that respect. Yeah, just to to add to that, I, I completely agree with you, Maria Teresa. B two B commerce is way behind in general in Latin America, um, and it's hard to understand why it hasn't you know taken off a bit faster. I mean, e commerce is still pretty behind, but B two B particularly hard hit. And I think you're pointing out something very interesting. The more B two B commerce or platforms come out there the more players like us will have even more data to give more credit to the right segment. Mm -hmm. And the more data you have, the less, I mean, the less risk you have too, because you can have better decisions making. And the less risk you have, the, the smaller amounts you can charge as well. So it's, again, the chicken and the egg. When you have all those components, you can lower your fees. Even the, 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 the people that will give you debt will lower the fees too. And then you'll get into the cycle of something that's really useful for, for these SMBs as well. Well, uh, let me just add, I, I completely agree with what they were saying, uh, but let me add a couple of more, more components to the to the mix. Definitely, when, when you take a look at the picture today in Colombia, it's, it's a big chunk is focused on. Ipe, I think we, we're having a problem with your connection. Oh, now you're back. Good. So, sorry. Now I was saying that when, when you take a look at the picture of Colombia right now, it's, it's a big chunk of focus on, on credit and there's Martins, Inove, et cetera, and several plays, players on that on that sense. Also a big chunk on payment systems and Maria Teresa is, we're talking, was talking about that. But we still have very low play, or not many players playing on on some places that are going to be. I, I will expect a huge development on the on the following years. And it's about a uh, insurance, insure tech. I think insurance has a very high potential growth. Uh, I mean, our penetration of insurance in Colombia is really low, really, really low, and it's only about mandatory insurance. So the potential growth is huge in the in this sense. And the other thing is, is wealth tech. I mean, our capital markets, we have been uh, paying a lot of attention into, a, into the development of our capital markets. I mean, we have a capital markets mission of uh, one, one or so years ago. Uh, we're gonna be presenting a law to the Congress, a bill to the Congress to actually boost the, the development of, of our capital markets. So in this sense, uh, the, the wealth tech uh, industry should be uh, paying attention to this and actually coming to Colombia much more than, than they are today. Uh, and so I will add those two to, to the mix, agreeing completely with, with what Maria Teresa and, and Martin were saying. Thank you. Definitely exciting times. So a lot to happen. Um, okay, so next question that we have is, it is worth remembering that many startups have limited timelines connected with their financing for Felipe. Will the regulation be out this year? 
So the connection frozen again? No? Not this time? No, I just kidding. <laughs> As it didn't I, work. <laughs> as I was saying, I was unfortunate to not, not to have the degree issue today, but yeah, it's a matter of days. Definitely something that is going to be happening. I mean, I've been saying this for, for a few times, but definitely, I mean, it's going to be signed probably as we speak. So it's, it's going to be a matter of days. So to answer the, the question directly, yes, the, the new regulation on payment system is going to be released in, in, a, in a matter of days. Thank you. Maria Teresa, when do you think Stripe will start operations in Colombia? I, I think as I'm quickly gonna, as quickly as it can. I'm going to throw this, I'm going <laughs> to throw this <laughs> <and leave it. laughs> So I think it, it will be determined by, you know, the regulation that Felipe is, is talking about. So basically, you know, Felipe, no pressure. It could, <laughs> it could be matter of days. You know, so yeah. let, let's put it that way, Felipe. I mean, there, there, is, there is clear indication that Colombia is an interesting market for Stripe and, 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 and Stripe is interesting for the market. So we, we look at Colombia with a lot of interest for certain. So Felipe, help us. No, I'm, I'm not kidding. Actually, as we speak, I've been reloading the page of Presidencia, yeah. so, <laughs> but not, not yet. I will let you know. <laughs> Okay, real time. That's nice. Yeah, real I was time. I was crossing my fingers. Maybe I was lucky enough to actually have it published, but now we still have fourteen minutes. Don't worry. <laughs> so, uh, you know, maybe one last question. So, the the country seems to really have consolidated itself as the third largest hub on, of fintech within Latin American regions, right? Falling be behind Mexico and Brazil. And we have discussed about this and, you know, how you can also look at those examples to, to do it better. Uh, so what are key factors in this growth and what can we do to keep the pace? What is missing? And I think, you know, it goes to what we already discussed a little bit, but maybe if we have just to summarize and, uh, and, you know, just give just very few points, like what would you say are your takeaways on this? I mean, if I may start, like, I, I, I'm going to say <laughs> really nice word about the fintech industry, where I, I truly believe that's part of the, of the success is that we, we actually have now a, a, a fintech industry in Colombia. I mean, the discussions are now with, a, with an industry itself, not players, not individual players trying to actually get in leverage on, on, on commercial interests. I mean, that's, and that's something that's different. Definitely, we have, you have to have a commercial interest, and that's for sure. But the discussions are on a, very, on a highly level. I mean, that you, when you're discussing the public policy, when you're actually discussing with the industry, and, and it's a matter of building all, with, with all the points of view altogether, and the, definitely the fintech industry is one of them. Uh, but now I, I, it's, it's very important to have this discussion uh, with this in mind. I mean, it's not that you have to deploy a regulatory framework for my, for my business model. No, why? Why your business model is important for the, for the public? Why do your business model is important for the consumer? What is going to be the added value for them? What is going to be the added value for financial inclusion, for the usage of digital transaction, et cetera, et cetera. Definitely uh, underneath that, there is the, 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 the commercial interest. Definitely. I mean, we're, we're very aware of that. But there is another level of discussion. And I think we have had that in Colombia, and that's part of the success. Well, you know, adding to that, which I, I completely agree. I mean, having that you know, fintech association and that being the kind of the, the speaker between you know, uh, the private sector and the government is very powerful because it's, as Philip is saying, it's not commercial. But I think there's other, other factors which are um, very interesting in general, what we're seeing in fintech. So you know, when I started again, 18 years ago, we weren't getting the caliber of entrepreneurs coming into the space now as, as we're seeing now so you're getting people with a lot higher education seeing it as a an opportunity of of a, of a career rather than just you know oh, i'm going to do you know, i'm going to do a startup but they're really thinking yeah actually i could i could go to mckinsey or i can start a fintech uh, and when you when you have that you have a, a completely different inflection you have different uh, level of, of entrepreneurs we've seen explosion on investment the last four years you know we've never seen the investment that that occurred from many vcs uh to the soft bank effect that's that's generated that um and then 
particularly on Colombia. I think Colombia is in a very strong position with its, uh, its tech and its programmers too, which has again attracted um, not only startups to maybe start there, but also foreign companies. I'm seeing foreign companies that are wanting to get there to maybe even start a, a tech stack. Um, so I think the combination of those has really put the fintech industry at a different level in Colombia. Yeah, I, I echo, you know, both of your perspectives. I think Colombia and uh, within the next 10 minutes, we'll have that decree signed. So we'll see. <laughs> it's, it's not going to allow me to continue to um, put pressure on him. No, I, I, we, I mean, it's definitely an, an, a very interesting market. I think that the Colombian government has, has taken the, the right approach to um, to look at the industry as a trusted advisor somehow into how this can be shaped in a way that puts Colombia in a in a very good spot in the region and, and globally, um, you know, and and we see we see that happening already. You know, there there are there are companies there are 150 companies in Colombia today that are using uh, Stripe Atlas, right? So you, you can you can feel that there is this movement there is this uh need and and interest as, as Mar martin was saying and you know platzi for example was one of the first users of atlas um in in back in 2016 so it's it's a very interesting opportunity you know we hope that this continues down the road of um a productive and constructive conversation for the Colombian market to evolve here. And, and I'm sure that, you know, companies like Stripe and, and many other companies will, will continue to invest in, in the country. So it's, it's very, very positive. Well, thank you, Maria Teresa, Felipe and Martin for sharing your insights. This has been very interesting. And I think, you know, as, uh, as Maria Teresa just said, let, let's keep the constructive conversation and, you know, let's, uh, look forward to, to having the new regulation being issued very soon and, and, and really companies like Stripe and others to, to go uh, into business in Colombia and to keep growing the market. So thank you again for that. Um, to all the attendees, please join us in the next session called Outsourcing in Colombia from Goods to Services, and that will start at 4 p.m.